The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn in your uh, Bible or look there on the screen at Romans chapter 8. We'll be uh, reading verses 31 through 39 this morning. And this second of three, uh, again, uh, for I guess lack of a better phrase of these farewell sermons, I want to really just take these opportunities to tell you the things I've always told you. Things I hope that don't come as a shock or surprise to you uh, from Holy Scripture and what I believe to be the good news of the gospel. So Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 31. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh Christ, give us ears to hear, ears that hear your words speaking to us through Holy Scripture. Give us eyes to see, hearts open to receive. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So for the last few years, uh, every Sunday, no matter what scripture I preach from, no matter what I said in the sermon, you've heard me say the same thing. God loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. But that's not original. <laughs> well, at least not completely, I guess. Several uh, years ago, I guess it was back when I was in college or seminary, back before uh, TikTok, and Kate Hamby helpfully explained to all of us uh, what TikTok was this morning. Don't tell her, I still don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, back before those kinds of videos were popular, before everybody could see those kinds of things, even before, uh, some of you might remember Vine, that was a thing for like a day, um, before Instagram, before a lot of this stuff, uh, videos just sort of seem to come out of nowhere and go literally go viral, like they would just take off. And there was one that, that was making its rounds uh, with some of my friends uh, about this woman who, who she was being kind of funny and was talking about uh, just all the things you should and shouldn't bring to a church covered dish, and really more, more specifically, the people who should or shouldn't bring things to a covered dish. Like some people, she said, some of y'all have no business bringing macaroni and cheese to a covered dish. Some of y'all shouldn't be trying to fry chicken to bring the covered dish. Leave that. Some of y'all, she said, just need to bring the plates to the covered dish. Some of y'all know people like that, I guess. Nobody here. We can all agree, right? But at the end of it, after she said all this, and she said, oh, remember, though, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. And I remember thinking, you don't know me. I'm just watching this on my computer screen. But as years went on, I started to think, yeah, isn't that, isn't that true about God, right? That God loves us, and there isn't anything we can do about it. Like, there's nothing we can do, as Paul says, to separate us from the love of God. These are, I don't, I don't often preach from Paul. To be honest with you, I think he's a little wordy sometimes. I, I prefer to preach from Jesus, but... But Paul, Paul writes this letter to the Romans, and man, it is a magnificent 
sort of theological thesis for Paul. In fact, I failed to say this in the early service. Romans is so powerful. How many, you, you've heard of the name John Wesley? John Wesley, he and his brother Charles wrote a lot of hymns. John uh, sort of started the Methodist church, but he was an Anglican when he died. But there's a story, you ask any Methodist, they can tell you, about John Wesley when he had his heart strangely warmed and he knew that the Spirit was moving in him. Well, the setting of this happens at a place called Aldersgate as he was walking by a Moravian church and he didn't hear singing, he didn't hear preaching, he heard one of the Moravian brothers reading the introduction to Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. Now think about that for a minute. That's what I call third-hand power. <laughs> they weren't reading Romans. They weren't reading Luther's comments on Romans. They were reading the introduction to Luther. And I've read it. I don't know how Wesley had his heart warmed, but okay. Um, but that's the power, I think. Romans is probably the go-to one for, for Paul, for people to quote Paul. And it's so different in its, in its purpose from the rest of Paul's letters. You have letters like Paul's earliest, the earliest books we have in the New Testament, First and Second Thessalonians, where Paul is writing to a church that is so caught up in looking up at the sky. Well, you said Jesus was coming back. We all quit our jobs. We didn't get married. Where's Jesus? And Paul writes and says, don't take it so literal, and tries to correct them, and then they overcorrect. So Paul writes at least one, probably two more letters to that church. And then there were churches who were sort of confused. Well, the, the law is gone and our Gentile way of living is, is not right. So how do we live in our households as Christians? And so Paul writes uh, these circular letters like Ephesians and Colossians and puts into those letters what we call household codes. This is how you live as Christians. And then there were letters that Paul wrote because he was angry at churches who were dividing, uh, churches who were keeping some people out like the Galatians. Paul's angry. Paul, I'm going to break just a little, little fourth wall for you. Paul cusses in Galatians. We didn't translate it that way in English because we're good church folks. But Paul cusses at the church in Galatia. And then there are churches where he's, he's wanting to encourage them, like the church at Philippi. And all these other sort of letters. Paul has a specific intent, but not Romans. Well, he has one, but it's not that kind of intent. Paul writes Romans, uses all these great words, explains all of his theology for the same reason any of us get really articulate and verbose when we're, when we're talking to somebody. Because Paul's going to ask for money. Think about it. If, if you're going to ask somebody for money, you don't go up there and go, hey man, I need $20. You go, excuse me, kind sir, I uh, have a purchase that is on my ledger and I need to borrow just a, a few. That's what Paul's doing writing this thing, and he wants to lay it out. And think about where Rome is. It is the capital of the world. This ain't Montgomery. This isn't Washington. It's the capital of the world. So when Paul writes to the churches at Rome, he's writing to knowledgeable, educated, most likely converted Jews living in Rome. These churches are wealthy. These people are wealthy. Paul wants money to take the gospel as far west as he knew, which was Spain. And so Paul, in Romans, lays out everything. He talks about the nature of God in Christ. He talks about, uh, here's a $5 word for you, soteriology. Lays out the idea of what it means, uh, what salvation means, is theories on the atonement. Paul uses a lot of really big, good, and complex words. But I have this feeling... When Paul wrote these words, he broke character just a bit. These are my favorite words in all of Romans. My favorite words probably of Paul's, maybe outside of the Philippian hymn. And Paul writes these words to say, what are we going to do? Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can anything separate us from the love of God? No, I'm convinced. And Paul says, Death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, anything in all creation, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, I think that's, first of all, I think it's powerful. But I think it's interesting that Paul, in his theological treatise, doesn't use more theological words. I am convinced 
that neither death, life, angels, rulers, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the grace of God in Christ Jesus. That sounds fine. That even is, is more fitting to Paul, at least as the, as the reformers would read Paul. That makes more sense, uh, or at least fits, right? It's theological. Nothing can separate us from the grace of God, but that's not what Paul says. Nothing can separate us from the salvation we have in God and Christ Jesus. That, that's, that's there in Romans. Paul outlines his salvation, his soteriology, what he thinks it means to be saved, but he doesn't use that word. Nothing can separate us from the hope we have in God and Christ. Well, that'd be fine too. It'd be wonderful. But it's not what he says. I'm convinced, Paul says, nothing in all creation can separate us from what? The love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I think when Paul wrote this, I don't know, this is pure speculation, take it for what it's worth. I think when Paul wrote this, he remembered listening to one of his companions, Luke. Y'all know Luke, right? Luke, the, the gospel, contains most of Jesus' parables. Luke, the gospel that is, is most uplifting of the poor, the marginalized, the oppressed, the women of the day. Paul had Luke traveling with him. And I don't doubt that at some point, Luke shared with Paul some of those parables that Luke had heard that Jesus had told. And if I were to ask you, just right off the top of your head. What one parable from Jesus sticks to your ribs the most? Which one is it? The parable of what? Somebody said it. Say it louder. Cover your mouth. Say it louder. The prodigal son. The, you know, if you had said the good Samaritan, you would have got credit, but that's not the one I was looking for. The parable of the prodigal son. That parable is so powerful. It's part of our vernacular. People who don't even know how to spell Jesus, don't know what, what verse and chapter it is in, probably couldn't tell you that there was a Gospel of Luke can say, ah, oh, the prodigal son has returned. It's in our culture, in our language. I, don't, I, I have this imagination that Paul, when he was writing this to the Romans, wondering, how do I really get it condensed? How do I get the kernel of the truth to them? That Maybe he remembered Luke. And one of his stories that one of the eyewitnesses had told him that Jesus had said there was a man who had two sons. And the youngest son came to him and said, Dad, I'd wish you were dead so I could have my money. Just give it to me now. And the father gives him his money and he goes and he squanders it all. That's where the word prodigal comes from. He runs to a foreign, a, a foreign land and Jewish re listeners would have perked up what? Squanders all of his money and winds up slopping some stranger's pigs to get by, wishing he could eat the slop in the trough. And so the man, the son, comes up with an idea. I'm going to go back to my father's house and I'm going to get down on my knees and beg my father to let me just be a slave, a servant in his house. And so he goes to his father. This is the idea he has. The, the, the artist Rembrandt paints uh, three scenes from this parable of the prodigal son. There's one where the son's at home, one where the son is living it up in a bar, just having a good time. And then the final one, which there's a large print of it in my office. It's called The Return of the Prodigal. And in this, in this painting, the, the son is clearly the prodigal. There, He's bald, his clothes are tattered, his shoes are falling apart, and he's kneeling in front of the father who's dressed in a, in a red robe with a nice hat, and he's got uh, two very distinct and different hands, one showing his strength, one showing his kindness, on the shoulders of the prodigal. As just, just on this side of the painting, there stands the brother, judgmental and frustrated and angry, and in the background, almost looking out at us, Rembrandt snuck himself in there. And I love that painting. It's, again, there's a big print of it in my office, but I, I realized it's wrong. Like Rembrandt painted wrong. He didn't know the story. 
The only way that painting is right is if Rembrandt intended to paint the son's intention. Because you remember how the rest of the story goes, right? The son is slopping the hogs, longs to feed himself from the pods there in the slop trough. Gets up, he says, I'm going to go to my father's house. I'm going to beg to be a slave. And what does it say? Does it say, does Jesus' story say he came home and he fell at his father's feet and begged for forgiveness and his father said, okay, you get to be a servant in the house? No. The story says, Jesus says, while the son was still far off, the father ran to him, fell on his neck and kissed him and said, bring a robe and bring shoes and a gold ring and kill the fatted calf because we're going to throw down because my son has come home. He never gets the chance to say, Daddy, I'm sorry, I, I squandered all the money. He never gets a chance to say, please let me be just a servant in your house. The father doesn't pace on the porch waiting for him to come back and say, I'm really going to show him some tough love today. He runs because I'm convinced that nothing, not life, nor depth, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things uh, present, things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all creation can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I'd like to think Paul heard that story from Luke and said, that's it. Yeah, we can talk about grace through faith alone. We can, talk about, uh, 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 we can talk about all those other things that he writes in all those other letters. We can talk about what justification and sanctification mean. But I can't help but think that when Paul wrote these words, he said, that's it. That's what it means. That nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. I asked him uh, in the first service, and I'm going to ask you, though I don't see many folks with their, their Bibles. That's not a judgment, I'm just saying. If your Bible has a footnote there, and maybe at the bottom of the page, in parentheses, it says, uh, nothing can separate us except, and maybe there's a list of sins, lifestyles, and identifiers that uh, are listed there. Uh, my Bible doesn't have one. It's not in mine. There is no parenthetical explanation that says, please see Article 9, Section B, Subsection you know, II for the listing of all the exceptions when it comes to the love of God. It's not there. Paul paints it as plain as he can. He could have used any other word it would have had as much theological power if he wanted it. But he doesn't. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And in case Paul missed something, I almost wonder if Paul said, somebody else might read this at some point, and I don't know, they might be... They might be flying in the sky. They might have computers in their pockets. I don't know. I don't think Paul thought this way, but who knows? I want to make sure I cover everything. And so Paul says, nor anything else in all creation. Without exception. Nothing. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Or to put it the way I, I like to say it, God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. God loves the person sitting next to you and there's nothing you can do about it. God loves the people when you turn on the TV and you think that person's an idiot. God loves them and there's nothing you can do about it. When you drive down the road and pass every car filled with every person, God loves them and there's nothing you can do about it. There may be people we want to do something about it, but there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing, nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing will separate any of us 
from the love of God. There once was a time when the word evangelical was a lowercase e. Now it's become a capital E, and they kind of group some of us uh, Christians in America as evangelicals, uh, call us a voting block, think that everybody thinks the same way, does the same thing. You know what that word means, right? It's from the Greek word eongelion. It means good news. And I don't know about you, but this is where I get really evangelical. Because if God loves us and there's nothing we can do about it, that sounds like good news to me. I'm convinced, Paul says, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because God loves us. And there's nothing we can do about it. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit, we're grateful for your love. We're grateful that there is nothing that can separate us from it. Even if we choose to separate ourselves, Lord, that you... You still run to us. You still love us. God, help us to take hold of that truth. Help us to live it each day. Help us to see it in other people. Those, Lord, that you love. And there's nothing we can do about it. So move now, Holy Spirit, as we listen, as we discern, God, as we respond. In Christ's name we pray, amen.